Welcome to the Worship Ministry Training Podcast, a monthly podcast for worship leaders who are serious about growing in their craft and calling. My name is Alex, fellow worship leader. Super stoked you're here. And if you're a new listener, I'm gonna encourage you to hit that subscribe button because every single month, I'm gonna give you helpful, practical guidance that you can immediately implement into your ministry. Hit that subscribe button and then go back through the past nine years of episodes and binge listen your way to a healthier ministry. If you're someone who is really serious about growing as a worship leader, I'm gonna point you to the Worship Ministry Training Academy. What is the Academy? It's an online training platform that will give you everything you need to build a thriving worship ministry. You'll get 10 in-depth courses on topics like set building, team building, musical excellence, vocal technique, and more. You'll get live monthly training workshops on topics that are relevant to you. You'll get exclusive expert interviews with some of the best worship leaders in the world. You'll get done for you ministry admin systems and audition process, onboarding documents, team training materials, and even team discipleship materials. We will take care of you so you can focus on leading your team. If that sounds like something that would be of help to you, you can try the Worship Ministry Training Academy for just $1 by going to worshipministrytraining.com. Sign up today for your $1 trial, and I hope to see you inside of the Academy. All right, let's get into today's episode. In recent years, worship music has focused more on creativity than clarity, more on catchiness than truthfulness. And the problem with that approach is that biblical worship is always revelation first, then response. And when Christ is clearly revealed in our songs, then the people will passionately respond in praise. That's just how it works. It's it's almost a formula. It's the biblical formula of worship. It's revelation, then response. The problem is where can we find these rich, clear, deep biblical songs? The truth is sometimes we just have to write them ourselves. And that's what today's guest did with his team at Journey uh, Church in Nashville. And so in today's conversation, we're going to be talking with Brett about how do we focus on clarity over creativity? And then how do we consider like the important factors of of the types of songs we should be choosing to sing in our churches for our churches good. So let's welcome Brett to the podcast. Hello, Brett. How are you? What's up? Hello. I'm grateful to be here. Thanks for having me on. And you're coming all the way from Nashville, Tennessee, where all the great musicians live and serve, right? That's right. We're, uh, We're actually in Lebanon, which is east of Nashville. So we claim Nashville and Nashville has to claim us too at this point. So okay. we're, we're about 25 miles from the heart of Nashville, but yeah, we're, we're close. Close enough to have all the good musicians. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So I'd love for you to tee this up. Your church started to write your own worship songs because you were frustrated with the lack of clear biblical songs that you were, you know, finding out there on Spotify. So you're like, let's just do it ourselves. Can you describe the problem or the trend that you were noticing for our audience, just so that like they can get a little bit into your head and be like, yeah, what was the problem you were seeing in in our modern worship world? Yeah. So in 2020, when everything shut down and churches weren't meeting live in person, it was obviously a good time to look at all the resources and all of the everything that was being put into like our, our services and whatnot. And so for me as, as a worship leader, I started thinking through the worship music itself. And there's something so formative about looking at a screen and no one in the room whenever you're leading worship. We started picking songs and what I realized was this growing trend of songs where content was being sacrificed at the altar of creativity. And um, ultimately, what I mean by that is there were these songs that it seemed to be, I wasn't in these writing rooms, so I don't know what was what the conversation was, but it seemed to be that uh, when it came time to write something clear or creative, creativity was always chosen over clarity. And so, so there, there grew this uh, influx of songs where they were cool, and compelling and musically they would grab people and move people because of the music but they weren't as clear as they could have been in the content that was being presented so there were there were cool songs that were actually ambiguous about a god who's made himself clear to us in scripture and so um i think that's damaging i think that's misleading 
it's not that these songs were uh, untrue it's, or, or uh, inaccurate as much as they were just inadequate. They, they were missing something. So we got convicted about that, and we decided we were going to start fighting for truth for our people. Um, I, think, I think these songs really uh, are supplementing or uh, becoming the sound bed for the deconstruction that you see around us because God can be anything. Jesus can mean whatever. And if a song is unclear enough, but it's truthful enough without the qualifiers around truth that are in Scripture, then they can mean whatever anybody has deconstructed their faith to, to mean if that makes any sense. So that, wow. that was kind of the heart behind what we saw and then like leading to a screen, leading to a, uh, a camera where there's no, no music to move people and no crowd response to make the song actually feel like it's saying more than what it is. You really get down to the heart. Everything's stripped away. What's the song actually saying? And does it matter to the believer? If, if I wasn't leading this song, would I sing it myself? That's, that's kind of some, context around all of it that i mean you just said something really profound and i i always like to ask why these things matter because if people don't understand why something matters they won't care what you have to say so that's why i always like to start the, the podcast like why something matters but you just said something that kind of leads into that which is these songs are so unclear that it's actually fueling the deconstruction movement which we're kind of seeing across christianity of people leaving the faith or tweaking the faith to fit their own desires or their own perspectives you're saying that potentially these songs are helping fuel that deconstruction movement is that what you said yeah if uh if something's not clear enough you know the deconstructed movement it's not that it's packaged in all untruth some of it is packaged inside truth but it's what's inside the truth that makes it untrue if that makes sense so to deconstruct something it for it to be appealing, it has to be masked in something. And I'm not saying this isn't a broad brush, like all worship music is terrible and like all camps are bad. That's not me saying that. I'm just saying I think there was a growing movement of creativity trumping clarity and content that we saw. And instead of taking it to Twitter and just joining, you know, people who like to be mad about things and not really moving the needle. We, we were like, you know what? We can care for our people, so we're going to fight for truth and clarity inside our walls. Yeah, that's so good. And I mean, I think this conversation, it's probably not going to be released for a long time to the public, but it's coming right off the release of an episode I did called Our Megachurch is Monopolizing Our Worship you know, music, basically, that the study found that there were only four churches that have written the top 32 songs that we're singing. And right. you're saying, instead of complaining about that, we're just going to write our own. And that was one of the things that the people who created the study, they said, go look for smaller artists. Like, you don't always have to choose songs just because they're easy to find, just because they're at the top of the charts, just because they're promoted on CCLI doesn't mean you have to sing them. Uh, write your own or find small uh, artists like Journey Co., you know, stuff like that. So they didn't say Journey Co., but I'm, I'm saying it. So <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. So, so besides that, huge issue you just brought up about deconstruction. Are there other reasons why it matters that our songs are both biblical and clear? Do you want to speak any more into that? It's all over scripture. You had referenced it even in your prayer before this, and I appreciated it. Uh, Colossians 3, um, let the word of Christ dwell among you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. So, I mean, it's, it's there earlier in Colossians it says, um, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. So as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world and not according to Christ. Ultimately, he's saying, you know the truth in Christ. If you're in Christ, you know the truth. So fight for the truth and don't be deceived. And there's so many other passages around it, but so much of church movements have become geared around non-believers and trying to be a church for the unchurched that we've lost the focus of the church, which is the people of God and fighting for truth for the people of God, with the people of God, alongside 
among letting the word of Christ dwell among us richly. And so it, I mean, it matters because it's a biblical command. It's a powerful thing when the people of God agree on the truths of God because it's a command of God. And so what better way can we spend our time than to try to articulate the things of God better for our people? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm assuming you're not only uh, singing your own songs at your church. You're probably still using other people's songs, probably. Maybe I'm wrong. But yeah. what were you looking for in a clear biblical song? Like, what's the criteria that you use to find a good congregational song? Do you have a certain um, set of filters that you use? And if so, can you share those with the audience? As far as, like, theme goes, it needs to be biblical. So if there are obvious scriptures that were uh, driving a song, like, uh, are you familiar with the term proof texting? So proof texting is when you have an idea and you find a text to support your idea that you came up with. Whereas uh, the opposite would be reading scripture and scripture influencing a theme and then writing around that theme. It's funny, uh, early on, whenever I was looking at like multi-tracks, they have scripture references. And you can tell which songs are proof text a lot of times by they wrote a song and all of a sudden they need a scripture reference. And so they just pull one out of the air and throw it on multi-tracks and, and you read it and it's like, this has nothing to do with the song. <laughs> yeah. And so finding songs that sing scripture, I think singing the word is incredibly powerful. You're putting melodies to the word of God. That's amazing. Or at least finding songs that say something that's like a theme within scripture. It's got a really strong base to it. So that's one thing. And then the other is like more practical, but singability and followability mm -hmm. is huge. Some people place a lot of uh, importance around familiarity, which I think is great. Old hymns, songs that people have known for a long time. But also I think singability, like what keys are you doing stuff in? I know some songs are recorded. You could just drop the key or hide in the key, whatever it looks like. Um, but also followability. Some songs are written in such a creative way that you lose people in the leading of it. So instead of leading people in worship, you leave people behind while you're singing a song because the melody just like goes in a you know direction that they either can't do or aren't expecting. So those are yeah. those are a few things. That's so good. Uh, the proof texting thing. It's like there's a couple of fancy terms like eisegesis is reading. Right into the text what you want and exegesis is reading out of the text what's actually there and that's a mistake i see a lot of young worship leaders uh make like because i always encourage worship leaders to build their sets based on the theme of the pastor so that there's a nice cohesion between the two and yeah. i always say be careful that you don't see the word like grace and then you think that the passage is about grace so you pick a bunch of songs about grace just because you saw one word about grace when actually the passage that's just part of the greeting grace and peace to you or whatever right like you know what i mean so i think it's really important what you're saying is like we as worship leaders we must be biblical people and what we should care about more than anything else is helping the congregation sing god's word back to god like i think we've gotten way too far into the musical side and like we've forgotten that it's just about us helping them sing god's word back to god right i mean it's it's obvious but like i think we've lost that so absolutely i, I think we have we've we've gotten so uh concerned about what we want to happen in worship that we've we just we forget maybe what's prescribed in scripture about what should happen and how things should be laid out. So yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Wow. So, I mean, I didn't send you this question in advance, but you know, what can someone do? Let's say there's a younger worship leader listening, or there's a maybe older worship leader, but who's kind of lost his way, her way, so to speak. Like, what can they do to get more back to the heart of like, I care about the Bible. I care about like scripturally investing into my church through scriptural songs. Like, how can they change their perspective or their heart or their habit of, you know, what they focus on? Like, how can they become more of a biblically saturated person? Do you have any thoughts? I think just falling more in love with the word yourself. So many worship leaders in churches who don't read the Bible. Again, that's not saying every worship leader doesn't. It's just saying I've met so many who don't. And mm. for the word of Christ to dwell among you richly in context that you're leading, it has to dwell in you. 
uh, personally, richly. And um, you can tell, you can tell when someone's leading if the word's in them or if it's not. And so, I mean, I think a big call is love the word, depend on the word. What if, what if the, the challenge was, I'm going to be the most dependent on the word and the spirit of anyone in the room and seek that not, not in a way of like in a prideful or arrogant way, but just because you you're so aware of your need for uh, the guiding of the spirit. And you're also aware of how misleading you can be without the help of the spirit. So yeah, growth in your own uh, studies of scripture will, I think change the way that you lead and the way that you think about leading the people of God, because your own hunger and thirst for righteousness grows and you realize that the only nourishment comes from the word yourself Mm -hmm. hopefully there's no one out there listening to this or watching this that feels this way but i'm like let's i'm envisioning someone who's just kind of gotten into worship music ministry because they like i don't know they saw how cool it looks on this on the instagram and this and that and like they're like this is such a boring conversation like who cares guys you're too you're taking it too seriously like I just want to play with my guitar pedal and <laughs> like that. Unfortunately, I think there are some people out there not who listen to this podcast, amen. Uh, but um, there are some people out there who probably, like you said, there's so many worship leaders out there who aren't reading the word anymore. Like we're yeah. we're addicted to our phones, we're addicted to Netflix, we're addicted to the newest movies that came out. We're like shallow, 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 shallow people, and it's like let's get into the habit of Bible reading. So I know yeah. maybe this does sound boring to someone young out there or whatever, but it's like, you know what? Like there's nothing more foundational than this. This is what changes people's lives. Not fancy screens, yeah. not lighting, not awesome guitar tone. All of those things are just tools. So I just want to encourage us to, and you you are as well, to get back to the Bible. I, I really believe a worship in the absence of truth is idolatry. So if you are a worship leader listening, thinking, man, this is boring, I would challenge you maybe to take a little bit of time off and get back into the word because the chances are you are probably contributing more to idolatry than leading people in worship because you're more consumed with what you offer than what you carry. Dang. Um, And so there's one point. Another thing I want to say with that, I was at a pastor's conference a couple years ago and there was this pastor who was talking particularly about prayer within his service. And he made a comment that they, they spend 30 minutes. In, uh, so it was like three 10-minute segments in their services. They devote that to prayer. And when he said that, there were over 600 pastors in the room, and they all kind of grumbled. They were like, oh. And he said, I, I know what you're saying. I hear you. That must be so boring to have 30 minutes of prayer in your services. And he said, but I want to challenge you. Bore the people who pretend to have a relationship with Jesus and feed your sheep. Wow. And it wrecked me because I think so often we care so much about entertaining goats in our midst that we fail to feed the sheep of God. And uh, our responsibility is to feed the sheep. Brett, I don't have the gift of prophecy, but I think you might end up being a teaching pastor at some point because <laughs> you have such a way with words. I noticed at the very beginning of the conversation, I didn't say it back then, but I was like, dude, this guy's t- turning all these phrases that are like deep and insightful and punchy and, and rhymy and songwriting ish Like you've got a gift with words. So uh, we'll see. Oh. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Appreciate it. I uh, hope it's making sense. No, it is. It's really great. Let me throw a curveball at you. What do you do when you find a song that is awesome, but it has one questionable lyric or line? What do you do in that instance? Because that seems to be something that happens over and over. There's like these great new songs coming out, but they've got this one line or this one lyric or part of the bridge is weird. What do you do? What do you do, Brett? Uh, we find a different one. Nice. Um, it's It's a simple answer, but... Dude, there are a hundred, I think there's 120,000 songs uploaded to streaming platforms per day. And so we're not at a loss of other song options. And I just, I think there are so many people who think, wow, I mean, this is a big song and everybody's doing it. And it was in my inbox from this, from this company that I'm a subscriber to. 
Um, so it must be just taking on the world. Um, so we have to do it. It's on the radio, all these things. Uh, I disagree with this one line, but I mean, everybody's connecting to it. So we'll just, we'll either do it and change the line ourselves and it'll come across cheesy or we do it and we don't change the line and we just deal with some either misleading people or people getting frustrated with it. I mean, these are all things that like I've thought through and have had to work through in years past with some songs that I loved, but said one thing that ruffled everybody's feathers. And ultimately where I landed was there are other songs that are more clear and just as truthful, maybe even more truthful that serve your people better. If your people leave your church thinking about a lyric that bothered them, even if they're singing a song that you changed the lyric of and they know that that's not the real lyric, they're leaving thinking about things that sh they shouldn't be in my mind. And so to eliminate distractions, to eliminate roadblocks, we just find songs that, that work uh, as they are. Yeah, that's good. And that's a hard answer. That's hard to hear, but it's, it's good. You know, I'm, I do think that Hillsong under Brooke Likerwood's leadership has moved from more ambiguous to more clear. And I'm thinking of songs like King of Kings. Well, that one's a great example of like very, I think, very clear. Maybe I'm wrong. You could disagree. That's fine. I, I won't be offended. But no. very clear and very congregational. Like it doesn't even have, really have a bridge. It's kind of the same melody throughout verse chord. It's like an old hymn. Like yeah. 10,000 Reasons is another example of like an, a new modern hymn, right? And it's like, why are those yeah. songs so impactful, so popular? Because they hit those two topics that you were talking about earlier, which is biblical, clear, and singable, easy to follow. So, Yeah, singable, followable, biblical, not controversial. It's up the middle. It's creative, mm -hmm. it's beautiful, mm -hmm. and it's truthful. Mm -hmm. um, nothing was compromised. And... Uh, I think there there are a bunch of those songs uh, that are out there. Yeah, there are at least hundreds and hundreds of them that you guys can use because I'm the same way as you, Brett. Like, there might be a song. I'll give you an example. Like, um, We Praise You. Uh, oh, 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 We Praise You. That song. That song, I think it's a s decent song for like, and it's upbeat. And so it's kind of, it fulfills that upbeat song purpose, right? That we all right. need more of. But like the bridge, this is what heaven sounds like. We pray. I'm just like, that's a throwaway. And I personally, and no offense to anyone who either wrote that song who's listening or who, who, who likes to use that song. I just, that bridge, it just tanks the whole thing for me. And to me, like you said, you use the word compromise. It's a compromise. So I'm not yeah. going to sing that song. It's like, I don't need to sing a song that's like mostly good, but then it gets lame in the middle. And then it's like, let's look for something better. Let's yeah. find something stronger. And another one, honestly, um, is uh, the one uh, where the bridge sings like, sing a little louder, uh, sing a little louder. It's like, what? okay, what? Like, what is that? Like, what are we? Right. <laughs> I just that that bridge just ruins that song for me. And there are other parts of the songs that you know potentially are weird or whatever. So I'm just like, we can do better. Let's just find a better song that doesn't have any compromises. I think yeah. compromises are killers. And so yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, for sure. And, I'm I'm with you on that. Yeah, and sorry everybody for uh, having my little rant, but this is my podcast, so why not? <laughs> True. Um, so what you did, Brett, you started combating this by first looking for more biblical songs, but then starting a songwriting ministry at your church. So tell us a little bit about that. What is the purpose of Journey Co. worship? And yeah, what is the purpose? And then I'm going to ask you a bit more about the mechanics of building a songwriting ministry, because I think some worship leaders are going to want to do that as well. So let's just start with like, why did you start Journey Co. worship? And it's a natural progression out of this conversation, but just right. share what you want. Yeah. So, I mean, when we saw, we saw the need, uh, and we took it as an assignment given the need was that there were songs that were not as clear and, uh, not as truthful as we wanted them to be. So, uh, our response, our purpose is to write songs that are truthful and clear. We want to hold true to the biblical integrity, but we also want to pursue non-compromising creativity in our approach to say things that are truthful and clear. We don't want to unsay 
beautiful truths with a with a bad song uh, musically, but we also don't want to beautify something that's untrue or unclear. So that's the purpose of Journey Worship Co. That's why we exist. Okay, now let's talk to the worship leaders who are like, I think I'd like to start writing songs for my church yeah. that are more more clear and more beautiful. Where do they start? Any advice? Like maybe it's just them songwriting or do you recommend having a group of people songwriting and just really general advice from you? You've done it. You're two, three years ahead of us. What would you tell someone who's two or three years behind you? It all goes back to the why. You have to have conviction driving you. If you don't have a why, you have nothing uh, and and you'll just find something else to do. It's also a really expensive hobby to just put out music because there's so many people putting out music. So... You need to have a why. Again, our why is uh, because we want to produce songs for our people, fight for truth that are clear and biblically saturated. So I casted the vision to our team and I told them what I saw was an issue, uh, a gap in our worship. They agreed. um, And I'm casting vision to like there were 35 people in the room at the time. And uh, I said, I think this is what God's calling us into this next season. And so we did an all call. We just said, hey, if you want to be a part of this, then we're not going to tell anybody no. Uh, We're going to put together writing groups of four, hopefully, sometimes three. And if we if we got a weird number, we'll put five in a room. Five is a little bit much. Four has been a sweet spot for us, three and four. But we just we put everybody together. Uh, We called writing days. People started writing. We started seeing people who bubbled up as like gifted in the writing and songs started being produced. Another thing that we did that I think freaks people out, but it was part of our vision, part of our conviction. If we wanted to be theologically rich, theologically sound in our songs, we needed theological gatekeepers to help make sure that we're not going out of bounds and what we're doing. We're still fighting for the right things. So I actually asked a couple of our pastors to be in our rights. Uh, We uh, surrounded them with creatives and it was the most incredible thing that happened. You know, pastors, preachers, they know how to start a point and end a point uh, and tell a story, get a theme out and creatives can make it creative. And so what ended up happening by, um, happenstance is my team then started getting discipled by our pastors in these three hour increments of time while they were writing songs. It was amazing. So there was, there was something very uh, glorifying to God about it. I think that we were writing songs within our, our church. There was something really edifying to our body, having songs that were written within the, the walls. And it was something really unifying to our team, just unifying around these songs a mentor had told me before uh, in writing that there are three pieces to a song. You have the content, the melody, and the arrangement. And so one of the things that was really helpful for me as we started writing and as I started assessing the strengths of everybody um, was finding the people who were good at each of those things. So finding the people who contribute more to content but didn't have melody ideas or arrangement ideas. Or finding people who were more contributors in the melody lane, but didn't contribute as much with content or arrangement, or then even the producers of the group who could who could take content and melody and make an arrangement that was creative and and worked for the theme. Most writers can do one of them really well, maybe a second, but rarely can a writer do all three. Mm-hmm. Um, and so trying to figure out what I was good at and then being able to explain it in such a way to say like, Hey, these are some things that I can work on, but I need to, I need to plan a right around my strengths and my weaknesses. And so I just, I kind of served as a baseball team GM where I was like looking and assessing strengths and weaknesses and putting together uh, strengths in each of those categories. And those were, that's where all the songs were coming from ones that had, content, melody, and arrangement. And that was really helpful for me and for us. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of questions and I think the listeners and viewers will have questions about like more practical questions about what you're sharing. Yeah. 
one of them was you got 35 people in a room, 30 people in a room. You shared your vision. In your vision, did you also share, you know, besides we need to do this because blank, did you also share like, I want the songs to be stylistically like this or sound like this because we're trying to write singable songs? Like, how did you cast a vision for congregational? Because every, creatives, like, everybody's got their own style. So how did yeah. you kind of direct the style? That's one question. And the other question is how often are you doing these co-writing sessions? Um, in the initial write, or in the initial uh, vision casting, it was less about the nuts and bolts of, of how it was going to happen, and it was more about why. So it's just a, a really clear why. Um, I read the Parable of the Talents. Essentially, two of the people invested, and, the, and one didn't. Um, and the biggest thing about that, I mean, there's so many stories within it and so many takeaways within it. But the one that didn't, not only were they disobedient, but their talent was then given away to somebody else who would invest. And I, the way I shared with them the conviction around that was, I think God has put something in our hands to steward well. And the thing that I don't want to happen is for us not to steward it well and for us not to invest and for it to be given away to somebody else. And then we see like we could have done that. Like, I, I just, I think that there's something there that um, there's just a stewardship aspect of, of our team that I, I started assessing and seeing like, we've got to do something with this. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was, that was part of the, the vision casting. Um, and then when we got together, it was more like, let's just see what we can do. Like, I don't want to put any parameters around people we all have a sound already, so let's just lean into that. And there are already songs that we that were working really well at our church, so we leaned into that too. Around that time was when City of Light kind of came on the scene. And so they were inspirational. Matt Papa, Matt Boswell, they were writing modern day hymns. And so some modern day hymns were kind of uh, some things that we were trying to chase down in our own context. But also we have other influences that uh, would lend itself to an upbeat opener or more of a like rejoice type energy song, uh, but full of content. So we kind of just got together, explained the why, and then chased down biblical truths in lanes that, you know, the makeup of the right would lend itself to. And then from there... For me, as the leader of the team, I had to work through like, okay, what is our sound? And we started working with a producer internally, uh, which was cool. There was a one of our writers became our producer, and we, he and I really worked through then like the makeup of a song. So some songs, when they were presented and demoed and sent to me, they sound completely different now that they're recorded than what they were as demos. But it was just. Uh, we didn't really put any restrictions around anybody. Mm -hmm. And then how often are you guys gathering to write? Yeah, so we, we do seasons. We um, I was just talking to one of our pastors today. Fall always feels like an exciting time around here, especially since 2020, because um, the fall is when we've uh, historically written. So 2020, 21, 22, now this year. We, we get together and we will write a lot more. Uh, we did a writing retreat last year. We'll do another one this year. And we'll have a couple of writing days as well. So as far as like frequency, it's more seasonal because there's a time to like what I call is shoveling coal. You're kind of in the hole of the ship, just like shoveling coal, making sure that there's energy in the ship to, to go where you're going. And then there's other seasons where we're traveling and, and recording. And, and so as far as like full on team, all hands on, the fall is a is a time that we jump into it and we'll do like one big session uh, every month or, or so for a few months. Um, but we also go through seasons of trying to write like one time a week uh, just to build up a bunch of songs so that we can shave off songs that maybe they're like almost really good but they're not great. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, so, it's, a, it's a seasonal thing. Just to point out, 
your pastors are investing in this financially to send some of you guys on writing retreats. And, and just so the listeners and viewers can just think about that, like it, it helps if your pastors are bought in and one hack to get them bought in is to include them in the writing. I think that's, I mean, it's not that you did that for that purpose, but that's a really cool benefit of including your pastors yeah. in the songwriting is like, first of all, they signed off on, yes, we want to be a songwriting church. So you got to pitch that. Secondly, getting them involved will then uh, allow them to be boots on the ground with you, which will then s help them to see like, wow, we should pour more fuel on this. Let's send a few people away on a, on a songwriting retreat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So by the way, for the listeners and viewers, I've done a lot of episodes on songwriting and starting a songwriting ministry at your church. So uh, look in the past episodes for uh, episodes by Stephen Duncan. That's Stephen with the PH. And then Andy Rozier has a couple episodes. One of them, I think, specifically is about starting a songwriting church, uh, a songwriting ministry at your church. So look for those, and I'll try to remember to put them in the show notes. But what I want to ask you, because I want to focus this, continue to focus this about, around biblically rich songs, like what have been some of the uh, effects that you've noticed on your church body as you've made this shift to more biblical songs? What are some of the results that you've been seeing, if, if any? Yeah, uh, I mean, more engagement. Uh, when I got here at the church over seven years ago, one of the things that was said was our church is not a singing church. And uh, my pastor, he told me, I want you to reframe that and say, instead of our people don't sing. I want you to reframe it and say, we haven't led our people to sing. And I didn't like that at all because I hadn't contributed to the culture that was here. But it was really good for me to work through because ultimately, without getting into all the details, I could. Um, but ultimately, we just realized it was a consumer culture where it was a come and see as opposed to uh, join in this. And what led to the response was the presentation of the gospel and the reading of the word. Um, and so songs that matter, songs that were clear and substantive and truthful uh, and supplementing transitions of songs or opening of service with scripture that will stoke the flame inside the believer. That's what has led people ultimately to sing. Um, so, I mean, the biggest reaction, the biggest response to robust songs is a greater engagement in the room. Oh, hello, everybody. I've been saying this for so many years. Thank you for uh, saying it with a different person's voice, because it is not about the lights. It is not about the sound. If you want to see more engagement from your congregation, it's what I said at the beginning. Revelation, then response. Sing better songs and lead pastor the room in biblical ways. You will see more engagement. And Brett is just reiterating that. And oh, I just, I wish people would get it because they're just like, more lights, louder sound. Yeah. And it's like, no, that has nothing. That's actually going to decrease, the I think that's going to decrease the engagement unless your senior pastor works really hard to create a culture of engaged worshipers through yeah. the biblical truth um, so yeah, that, thank you for sharing that. That was the result yeah. that you saw as you started to sing these songs. Um, last question for you, besides, you know, writing your own songs, where do you find good biblical rich songs? You mentioned City of Light. Um, what else, where else are you finding these so that our, our listeners and viewers can find them as well? Yeah, we, we kind of have a tighter pool, um, but City of Light is a, is a great resource. I think Shane and Shane, their Psalms albums are incredible. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, albums are are awesome. Um, they are also just really great uh, to listen to. They're very talented. Yeah. Um, they don't lack creativity with what they do. Um, uh, some of the worship initiative guys within that, um, Aaron Williams is a new guy who uh, is in some of the same environments that, that we're in. He writes really great songs, and he's really thoughtful in his approach. Um, the Gettys, uh, I know that some people might think, oh, that's the Gettys. They, they just do hymns in, in an Irish way. But I, I think that what they do is uh, serving the church really well. And we don't do all their songs, but there are some that come from their mix that uh, that 
have been really great for our people, and I'm, I'm really thankful for their ministry. Matt Papa, Matt Boswell, they're kind of like the new dynamic duo uh, when it comes to resourcing churches that are trying to sing rich songs. And so uh, they're really great. Andrew Peterson, uh, Izzy Worthy has been a great one as well. So that's a few that we, yeah. we kind of pull from. That's that's awesome. Um, and then obviously we're going to tell people where they can find your original songs yeah. as well. So before we do that and before we go into our Academy Q&A session with our uh, people watching live, hello everybody who's still watching live, thank you. Do you have any final encouragements, exhortations, words, wisdom for people about this topic of biblically rich, clear songs? It's really hard for you to build a culture that sings rich theology and cares for the scripture if you aren't in the word yourself. So my, my call uh, to all worship leaders would be grow more in love with the word of God. Be in the word, pray the word, read the word in your gatherings, write songs that are biblically truthful and uh, aligned, sing songs that matter, uh, and, and let the word dwell in you richly and shape you. And um, I think your people will be better for it because uh, you're oozing the richness of the gospel because you're, you're lapping it up yourself. So I, it really just is a, is a call to be in the word yourself. If you're not, if you're not in the word, it's really hard to present something that you don't know really well. Um, so my prayer, one of the prayers I have for myself often is Lord, make me a more accurate representative of your word so that, uh, we will respond more accurately to your word. Mm-hmm. Help me, help me be a more accurate representative and may that fuel my response in a more accurate way. And that's, that'd be my prayer for all who are listening. That's so good. Basically be more of a pastor and less of an artist, right? Get in the word. Yes. Um, okay, so where can people find your music online and or track along with you guys? Yeah, all streaming platforms. Uh, we just released volume two, which is the very non-creative way to say it's the second volume of all of our songs that we put out. Uh, and it's, it's on, Journey Co. Worship. It's Journey J- Co. It's Journey Worship Co. Journey Worship Co. Thank you. Yeah. That, that people would not have found it. Yeah, so I, and I will link it below um, in the show notes or the YouTube description. Yeah, so. Journey Journey Worship Co. It's all it's on all streaming platforms. We have resources on multi tracks, praise charts, loop community, CCLI. All the songs are available there. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where you can find some videos that we've done, some green room sessions where we just come in here in this room and do an acoustic version of the song and others that are live and others that are like more rehearsal sessions without a crowd in them. But, uh, yeah, all of those places. And we have a Christmas record coming out, uh, in a few months as well. So probably about about the same time as this podcast actually goes out to the public. Perfect. Yeah. So everybody, uh, check out what, do you know what it's called yet? Or it's too early to say, uh, we have some names, uh, but that, not are, decided. that are in the works. None, none decided, but the whole idea of it is we, we've kind of internally been saying we want to resolve Christmas. There's so many Christmas songs that talk about Jesus' birth and the excitement around his arrival, but they don't get to why he came. And so we, we sing a lot about the cross at Christmas because that's why he came, to come and save his people. And so we're, it's, it's more of a Christ has come type record, and this is what he came and did. Nice. So uh, I will probably link that in the, uh, the show notes as well, but it, it should be releasing your album about Christmas stuff should be releasing about the same time as this podcast episode goes out to the public. Awesome. Uh, but thank you for uh, sharing all this with uh, everyone who's listening after the fact. Uh, for those uh, Academy members who are watching live, we are going to go into our private Q&A session. And for anyone who is listening to this after the fact and, and you're like, I want to be part of these private Q&As, you can. Uh, you can try the Worship Ministry Training Academy for just $1 by going to worshipministrytraining.com. You'll get 
15 days. Uh, it's actually free. I'm just going to be really honest. I say $1 so that you're not afraid to go through the process of entering your, your credit card, but I actually don't charge you at all for 15 days. So at least come inside the Academy for 15 days for free uh, and hang out with us and uh, be part of these conversations. Plus we have all of our courses and our community and our live monthly trainings that we do. So it's it's been really fun um, building this and, and we have a great community here. So join us, worshipministrytraining.com. Uh, thank you guys. And let's jump into our live Q&A. Academy members, hold tight. We'll be right back. Thanks for tuning in today. I hope this episode encouraged you, helped you, and pushed you forward in your ministry. If it helped you, can you take a second and help us by sending it to just one person that you think needs to hear this? And if you're feeling extra nice, leave us a nice, shiny five-star review on Apple Podcasts or like this video if you're watching it on YouTube. If you want to discuss this episode or ask questions, we do have a free section in our academy where you can post comments and questions and chat with other worship leaders just like you and also sample some of our courses. And you can go to worshipministrytraining.com slash free to join us inside the free portion of the academy. If you're looking for more, check out the Full Access Academy. You can get 15 days for just one dollar to start and try things out. Again, you can try all of it for 15 days for just one dollar by going to worshipministrytraining.com. Hope to see you inside the Academy or else I'll see you next month for another helpful episode.